Hello, everyone. Welcome to Danger on Delmarva. My name is Rhonda Jefferson, and I'll be your host as we explore the dark and winding roads that lead around the Delmarva Peninsula. If you're not familiar with Delmarva, it's a region on the east coast of the United States that includes all of the state of Delaware, Maryland to the east of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and Virginia to the north of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. If you're new here, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back. So today I'm going to give an update or more information on a couple of cases that we've discussed before, um, with one of them being a little more detailed and longer as we have more information. Um, I was going to have three shorter stories or cases on this episode, but while looking into the other, I found out that a similar case had taken place at the same location. So I'm going to make that into its own episode. At the beginning of every episode, I do want to make everybody aware that there may be discussions of topics that can be very sensitive. And especially today, we will be talking about abuse and death of a child. So I do just want to make everybody aware of that in case this is an episode that you may not want to listen to. And I definitely understand that. Most of the stories that I will cover, you know, do contain some discussion of violence or death or some type of crime taking place. Um, You know, any one of those topics or all of those. And just a little update on the number of listens or downloads that I've had. Um, We're still inching towards 5,000, but hopefully within the next month or two, we'll have 5,000 downloads or listens. Um, which will be a a good milestone for me because I really wasn't sure how many people would listen, Um, you know, when I started the podcast. And I'm not huge into social media. I'm trying to get a little better at it and into the, um, you know, the new types of social media that are now popular. I will say some of that is because some posts that I see or comments just drive me crazy. So I kind of limit it so that I won't get upset or mad or, you know, anything like that. I just find it easier to not always read the comments. But again, I'm constantly trying to get better. I'm going to go into another site later today and try to start an account there. Once I have all of those links, I will put that in the description of the episode. Also, Links or references to everything that I used in this episode will be in the description as well. I do also have another podcast called Mystifyingly Missing True Crime and Thought-Provoking Events. I know, it's a long title, but I'll leave links to that as well, even though I'm running behind on an episode for that podcast as well. But it basically covers the same topics, but in a broader geographical range. If you do like the podcast, please like and share, you know, depending on the platform or app that you're listening through, you may or may not have an option to leave a comment or a like or anything like that. But if you do, I would really appreciate it because that helps the, the podcast grow because it brings it up further into the algorithm. And I do also have this connected to a YouTube channel. So um, it's a very basic like audio file that's uploaded, but um, I know myself, I listen to a lot of podcasts on YouTube. So it's playing while I'm doing stuff around the house or crocheting. But, um, you know, again, it just will kind of help the podcast grow. I do have links also to a PayPal or buy me a coffee in case anyone would like to donate to costs of running the podcast. And that would include you know, things like the platform hosting or, um, you know, documents or certain things that I need to get as source information that I may have to pay for. I do really find newspapers.com invaluable as it gives me a ton of information. Um, But, you know, that is a source that does cost to use as well as, um, you know, by and I haven't gotten any documents from a government agency yet because they re- they denied my Freedom of Information Act request. Um, 
but if I ever were to be able to get documents, they would charge a fee. So, you know, I I don't necessarily expect anything, but it would be much appreciated just to try to keep things running along. With all of that being said, let's get into today's episode. The first thing I'm going to discuss is um, the Indian River School District, which um, does have a school named Sussex Central High. Um, And on the last episode, I discussed some not so positive news about the school, how in a very short period of time, you know, less than 10 years, there were multiple people arrested and charged with having inappropriate relationships with a student. With one of the cases having a twist when it was found that the minor student was actually an adult who lied about his age. Uh, so yeah, definitely didn't see that coming at the beginning. So unfortunately, Sussex Central High School has been in the news again um, over the past couple of weeks. Information on one of the incidents is extremely limited as an investigation is still going on. So um, I do want to say with that then, everybody is innocent until proven guilty. So we do have to remember that going forward while while the investigations are taking place at the school. Sussex Central did report that they had placed some of their teachers um, or staff members on administrative leave. Like I said, the school district has been pretty tight-lipped about what the investigation is um, for. However, after receiving many inquiries from members of the community and from the press, they did go in and elaborate just a little bit more, but really didn't provide any of the specific details about what was going on. Um, What they said in a summary was that it wasn't unusual for staff members to be placed on leave for any number of reasons, and that could be an allegation made against them, or if there's just an investigation going on where they might be involved or not, they are placed on administrative leave. Um, And there may be some other things possible, but for the sake of this, um, it sounds like it falls within those two, um, either an allegation or an investigation. There has been some chatter on social media, but we always have to remember until that's confirmed, that's rumor. You know, it's not confirmed fact, but if what's been seen about that is true, then the staff members at the school you may not have done anything wrong at all. And just, you know, again, based on comments and multiple ones, that's what it sounds like. But if there is more information about this that comes out, I will be sure to let you know. Um, It just came out so quickly after, or, you know, so soon after I had done an episode about the specific school. And before I even began writing this episode, there was yet another incident during the graduation at Sussex Central this year. So the graduation, the biggest day of most teenagers' lives up to that point. During graduation, members of the audience actually got into a fight, and it was so bad that the police had to be called. So when you know the first police officers responded and you know they entered the field um, you know, where it was taking place, they saw that a teenage female was beating up a woman who was later determined to be 48 years old, but there was no name given. So that's how I refer to her. But she was being kicked and punched by this teenager. Now, the teen did end up walking away from the woman, but the police also saw that there was a 29-year-old male who was punching at people in the audience as well. So they had to break out, break up apparently, you know, a couple of fights or at least a brawl that had spread out. Um, So they, you know, they had to really take over and do damage control to try to calm the audience down so they could continue the graduation. Now they did keep an eye and try to get, get the 16 year old girl to talk to them. But when they saw her walking across the softball field, she actually started to get into another fight before they even approached her. 
So, of course, they saw that a new fight was going on. And so they had to you know, step in and stop that. Once they did identify the girl's father and they wanted to talk to her, he was not very co cooperative at all. So the father was being uncooperative in this instance. So that's kind of setting the example for, you know, his daughter about, you know, what she should or should not be doing. And, you know, that unless you've done something wrong, it's usually better to cooperate with police. And even if you've done something wrong, usually it's better just to cooperate um, as well. Now, the next day, as they had not um, yet spoken to or interviewed the 48-year-old woman, um, she did come into the police station the next day and brought her daughter with her. The 48-year-old had you know, basically minor injuries, like a scratch to her nose, but her daughter had a black eye and a swollen nose. So that was also done by the same 16-year-old. Names have not been released, probably because of their ages. And in the case of the 48-year-old, um, they may have withheld her name because if we know her name, then someone might figure out who her daughter is. But, you know, just at graduation, there was this fight. And the 16-year-old did turn herself in at the police station, and she was charged with two counts of assault. She was charged with two counts of assault in the third degree and one count of disorderly conduct. Now, the district itself, itself did make a statement, and, you know, while a lot of it is the normal, I'll just say jargon, that's used to try to be polite and to assure people. The, the school did recognize the fact that this fight would tarnish the graduation memories of the students there. Um, the statement did say, quote, certain guests chose to tarnish what was a night of celebration for members of the class of 2023 and their families, end quote. So the police are still investigating this case as well. So there's not really a lot more information that's out there that's been released. But this just feels like it's a trend going on. And at times, I think, is it always just the children or is it the parents and the example that they're setting as well? You know, in this case, we see that the father of the 16-year-old was being uncooperative, which will lead to her attitude on how to cooperate or not with the police. And she was actually charged, but then released to her father. But it's not just happening, say, at Sussex Central. Um, I may have mentioned this before, but if not, um, you know, it's something similar. Last year in my town, um, which is still in the same county as Sussex Central, um, but where my kids go to school, there was a brawl at a bridge ceremony. And that's where um, a middle schooler is crossing the bridge to be a high schooler. So yes, a fight broke out at the bridge ceremony last year. There was a strong police presence and the ceremony was held in a more compact space, whereas previously it had been in um, or out in the football field. So you know, there were a lot more people, but they said, no, they wanted it you know, smaller this year because of what had happened. And so you know, in my case, my father, you know, didn't get to see the bridge ceremony, as well as many other family members who wanted to see their loved one walk across the stage. So this is just a relatively small area. You know, we don't have huge high schools and you know, middle schools, but it's setting an example of fighting or trying not to obey the rules. And it just happens that these examples include violence. I do want to say that it's not every parent um, that this applies to, but in many instances where a child is acting out um, or is committing some acts of violence, it's usually because they've been exposed to that. At least when I went to school or where I went to school, things were much more strict. Um, one time, a much bigger student pushed a smaller student and 
the smaller and younger student hit his head on the bricks of the building and he was expelled right away. I mean, there was like zero tolerance. He was gone. He was old enough that he could drive. And I think he left pretty much on his own anyway. But, you know, his parents were notified and he had left on his own. But yeah, again, there was zero tolerance for violence. And it didn't matter that this student was an athlete and on our sports teams, you know, that type of activity or those actions were not permitted. And while that may be a pretty harsh um, punishment for one time, it's very possible that that other student could have hit his head, you know, harder or in a certain spot where it could have caused permanent or long-term damage. We were just lucky that nothing like that happened. And unfortunately, the second case that I'm going to go over, it does include violence as well. Violence against a child. Now, I've you know, had a couple short segments on the case of Emma Cole. She was known as Baby L when she was found. And that was spelled E-L-L-E um, because... She was found after she had been in a softball field for a while, and her remains appeared charred. A little three-year-old, somebody walking their dog, came across the gruesome site in Smyrna, Delaware. Her remains were found on September 13th of 2019, and because of the condition of the remains, it could not be determined exactly when. She was put there as it could have been as early as July. I have looked at aerial images from online um, for the softball field, and it is rather large. But, you know, I find it a little surprising that her remains would have been left in an area that someone would probably be able to find them pretty quickly. What's really disconcerting about this is the softball field is within view of a school. So this poor little child was left there alone. Her remains were desecrated, and it was all within view of where other children played and learned and went to a school that she would never get to go to. Now, I do want to clarify one thing. Some articles and source documents said that her remains were charred. Others said that there was a fire um, nearby, but... I've seen more that say that the remains were charred. So just horrendously, they tried to get rid of the remains or hide identification in that manner. Now, there was a wide push from the Smyrna Police Department, and they wanted to contact police and departments nationwide to try to see if there was any information about this little girl. Um, They weren't able to find any children in the region who had been reported missing that match the description that they had um, at the time, you know, with very limited information at that point. Um, But they really did push to try to find out her identification because, of course, that's the first place you want to start. There were images that were generated based on a 3D imaging of her skull, and she was thought to have been either of Caucasian or Hispanic heritage and had wavy brown hair. The Smyrna police did work with other agencies, with even the FBI becoming involved later on. They did reach out for help, which I find commendable. You know, they realized this was something that they might need assistance with. And, you know, in cases where agencies are looking at you know, missing children and they can't find a child that matches this description, usually that will mean that the the people who would normally report a child missing, so her caregivers, parents, custodians, that they hadn't reported her missing. We know that usually, you know, when someone goes missing or is murdered, it's those closest to them that are guilty. Not all the time, but in many, many cases. In the case of a child, it would then be her parents and step-parents that are looked at first. These are the people that a child is supposed to look up to to respect and to emulate. And in little Emma Cole's case, it was those people who betrayed her. 
As we know from previous episodes, Christy and Brandon Haas were arrested in connection with the murder of little Emma Cole. Here's the rest of her story. It took a little more than a year to get an identification. An anonymous tip came in, which I later read was um, coming from Emma's grandfather. Now, once police had this information, they were able to track down um, her mother, whose name is Christy Hawes, and her stepfather, Brandon Hawes. They were now living in Pennsylvania. It was in February of 2021, so a few months after she was identified, that documents were unsealed. Prior to that, um, there really wasn't even as much information as there is now about the case. Um, we were able to find more information about you know, her background, about you know, her family life, and there were three other siblings. Now, some documents online do give their names, but I'm not going to do that because they're children. And they've already lost a sibling. They've lost their mother, which we'll talk about in a moment. And, you know, they've gone through a lot, so I'm not going to put their names out there. We also have to think about those siblings that they've witnessed violence through their formative years. So, Going back to setting an example, that's what they grew up with, at least during the first part of their lives. So they're kind of starting out at a disadvantage, and hopefully now they are thriving and doing well. I really, really hope so, because this is a horrendous thing for a child to have to live through and to know what their mother did. Now, you might be asking, was there anybody else in her life that could have questioned where she had gone? So yes, there were family members that had talked to Christy and she told one family member that little Emma had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. She said that she had been admitted to the children's hospital and even provided a name of a doctor. Just kind of on a side note, personally, I've never heard of a three-year-old being diagnosed with schizophrenia. While I know there are some cases in children, that's re really rare. You know, normally it starts to happen once somebody is, say, 18, 19, at least in that range. You know, that's just what I've heard about it previously. So to hear that a three year old supposedly has schizophrenia, that was a little surprising to me that she would give that as the excuse. Um, also, if we look at who may or may not report that a child's missing, in some cases we hear the schools have reported a child missing, but Emma was not in school. She wasn't in daycare. So there was nobody there, at least in you know, that field, that would be looking out for her because she hadn't yet started school yet. Now, once the police did have this information of where to look, um, they did track down Christy and her husband, Brandon, who had married in May of 2017. They tracked them down to a hotel in Pennsylvania. What having a lead also allowed the police to do is they were able to kind of narrow down time frames, you know, look at movements in that time frame. And there was security footage of um, the school. There was a camera pointing in that direction of the ball field from the school and they had seen a vehicle approach a softball field one night in September of 2019. And it looked like an adult did get out of the car and they were there from 12, 14 AM to 1 37 AM. So this was done in September, which makes more sense to me um, because when they said July to September, one of my thoughts was in July, you're probably going to have kids out on, you know, summer break. Some might be playing in the, the park or you know, the area around the softball field. So, you know, September makes a little more sense as, you know, kids would be in school. I don't know if they really thought that far, but, you know, that's just where I would or what I was thinking of when I heard it be, could be from July to September. 
also as um, we don't have her father's name, at least not that I found it anywhere. There was an aunt who actually had custody of Emma Grace when she was younger, starting at around three months old. Before then, um, Christy and this aunt was the father's aunt, which would make it Emma's great aunt, that kind of split um, the caregiving duties for Emma Grace as Christy was struggling with addiction and substance abuse at the time. So Emma Grace's great aunt was really active in her life and they knew, you know, looking at her circumstances with what her mother was going through and struggling with, you know, substance use that they tried to really like spoil Emma to a degree and she was adorable. So I think it would probably be pretty easy to do. I mean, she just had the cutest smile and you know, looking at pictures, it just makes it really hard to believe somebody could do anything like that to a young child or to anybody for that matter. And also there had not been any, been any behavioral issues um, from Emma previously. So the story about her being diagnosed with schizophrenia you know, it was still kind of hard to believe, but of course, when the police went in to um, you know, investigate and they contacted that hospital with a subpoena, Emma was not shown to have ever been a patient. So, you know, there was absolutely no truth to what Emma, I'm sorry, what Christy said about her daughter, Emma. After Emma's birth, it didn't seem like Christy stayed in one place for too long. Emma was only three when she died, yet she had been born in Indiana and had lived in Delaware for maybe a little more than a year. And then Christy and the rest of the kids moved to Pennsylvania, you know, along with stepfather Brandon Haas. So I have to wonder if Christy was just trying to get away from anything and everything that could connect her to the little girl found on the baseball field. But I will say that the images that, that were created with the help of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, those you know, likenesses were good enough that the grandfather recognized it. The couple and the children were found at a comfort inn in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania. And the FBI did work with surveillance as well. And as we've seen in some cases, police will sometimes have to resort to some messy tactics to get what they need. It was noticed that Christy and one of her children came out and threw a bag of garbage into the dumpster. The um, surveillance team gathered that trash and it was packed up and sent to be tested for DNA. Now, they couldn't just go buy that DNA, though, to verify that Christy was the mother of Emma, at that point known as Baby L. However, again, like we've seen in other cases, if there's a match to the DNA, then it's usually very easy to get that court order to verify the actual you know, DNA, to do a blood draw or a buccal swab to compare. And once that DNA was completed, it showed a very high probability that Emma, baby L, was the daughter of the woman who had contributed DNA to a straw in the garbage bag. To further bolster the case against Brandon and Christy, um, Brandon, Brandon was previously seen driving a red Chevy Malibu. Now, this was at a time while he was under surveillance there was also another time where police contact had been made with Brandon and the body cam footage showed the same red car. Now, with the distance of the security camera from the middle school to the ball field, investigators could not tell 100% if it was the same car, but it did match the description. Once the police had warrants and they were arrested, they were charged with actually slightly different things. Um, Christy Haas was charged with endangering the welfare of a child by doing or failing to do acts 
resulting in a child's death, and that was two counts. Then first-degree child abuse causing serious physical injury to a child through abuse and neglect, endangering the welfare of a child with the intent to injure or knowingly recklessly injuring a child causing death, second-degree assault by recklessly or intentionally causing serious injury, endangering the welfare of a child with the intent to injure or knowing recklessly inj injuring a child, hindering prosecution by delaying, preventing, or hindering discovery, abusing a corpse, and reckless burning or exploding, and first-degree murder by abuse or neglect, recklessly causing the death of a child, two counts. Now, you might be wondering, why are there different counts for murder on here? And I've seen that before in other cases, and you know, I've wondered why, in some cases, they've actually said the reason why, and it matches the reason in this case. It was because the exact circumstances of the crime were not known, mainly because of the condition of her remains. So it allowed for different counts or charges to be considered so that, you know, if a jury thought one charge better matched what they thought happened compared to another, they could charge um, or convict on one of them. That way it helps assure that, you know, there is some type of, you know, punishment for what they did. Um, because sometimes if there's a limit, say if you have all first degree murders, sometimes a jury may not think it's first degree. They may think it's manslaughter and that may cause, you know, some jurors to not vote for guilty. And if that's what their heart is telling them, you know, based on what they heard, you know, I'm glad that they are standing up for what, you know, they believe is right. But at the same time, if there's a limited you know, number of charges, then that means somebody could go free who committed a violent crime. This helps kind of limit the possibility of that happening. Now, Brandon Haas was not charged um, with the same things that his wife was charged with. Brandon was charged with endangering the welfare of a child, do and fail to do acts resulting in child's death. That's two counts. First degree child abuse causing serious physical injury to a child through abuse or neglect, endangering the welfare of a child with the intent to injure or knowingly recklessly injuring a child causing death. There were four counts there. And again, I believe that's so they can have you know, different variations depending on how they think the crime played out. Um, and the other count was hindering prosecution by delaying, preventing, or hindering discovery. I did find it odd, too, that he wasn't charged with the burning charge. I guess that was a way to make sure that somebody got some time, at least, if they weren't found guilty on the other you know, crimes. But um, you know, considering he was the one seen most likely driving the car, to the ball field, I would have thought he had that charge too. I know it's a minor charge, but really, um, it does come up in another minute though. In what I see as a miscarriage of justice to a certain extent was Brandon's bail was set at $8,000 secured bail. $8,000. And he knew that his wife had killed her daughter. He took the body, the remains, to the ball field to be set on fire, and his secured bail was 8000 Now, Christie's was 100000 cash bail. Brandon was able to meet his $8,000 secured bail, but Christie was not, so she remained in jail until she took her plea deal, which would send her to prison after the sentencing. So Christy Haas did take a plea deal, on May 25th, and the plea deal included the charges of murder by abuse or neglect, abuse of a corpse, and three counts of endangering the welfare of a child. Now, given what baby Emma had gone through, I really think there should have been more charges that she pled guilty to, uh, that there should be more time. So the sentencing has not been done yet. 
there would be 50 years on a murder charge normally, but she is only having to serve 30 years in prison. So given her age, she's still relatively young. She could still see the outside of a prison before she dies. So all of the other charges were dismissed, and she is now looking at 30 years in prison. There is always the possibility that a judge could refuse you know, a sentence for a plea deal, but that does not happen often. It is extremely rare. So probably we can count on Christy being sentenced to 30 years. The sentencing for the case is set for July 10th, and that was so that some relatives who lived in Indiana could travel and be there for the sentencing. Now, originally, as I'm writing this up and going through details, I was going to end this with saying Brandon still has to appear, you know, before a jury in a court as his trial is coming up and he hadn't made a plea deal. But after Christie did, he was pretty quick to come in and make a plea as well. On May 26, 23, he took the plea and pled guilty to one felony and three misdemeanor counts of endangering the welfare of a child. And like Christie, all of the charges against him otherwise were dropped. As for his sentencing, as of the date of me writing this, he does not have a date provided, so we don't know exactly when that will be. But everything that he had been charged with could have had a 44-year sentence. But since this was a plea for three misdemeanor counts, of endangering the welfare of a child with only one felony. He's now only facing up to eight years in prison. So to me, that's just unfair and disgraceful to the memory of Emma Grace. Emma's family was also not notified that Christy would be taking a plea. And they did think the punishment was too light. And I think a lot of us can agree with that as well. Um, one family member who was just noted as being Emma's great aunt said, quote, I feel like I'm being hit by a bus all over again. I am so mad that they didn't even bother to say a damn thing to any of us. We should have had the right to know in case we wanted to be there, end quote. Even though a name is not provided here in the article that I read regarding this, um, I have to wonder if it's the same great aunt that Emma lived with for part of her life. And if so, it's completely understandable why she feels, you know, so upset and frustrated and angry that she wasn't able to be there. Now, after the plea, Attorney General of Delaware, Kathy Jennings, said of Christie's plea, quote, what this defendant did to her own daughter was heinous. And this week brings a complex and harrowing case to a just end. This conviction doesn't just bring certainty and outcome and a lengthy sentence. It ensures that Emma's young siblings, who would otherwise have been absolutely required to testify at trial, will not be re-traumatized by having to relive the terror of Emma's last days. I'm enormously grateful to the DOJ team and many investigators who took on this difficult case, identified Emma, and ultimately secured justice. Today, like every day, we're reminded to hold our young ones close, end quote. Now, the crime itself actually had a lot of coverage worldwide. I saw um, articles from New Zealand, Britain, um, Canada. So, you know, this little girl her memory, her name will live on. And as I say in so many other cases, we, we should really try to learn something from each case. And there are just some things that were kind of red flags to me with Christy. The fact that she moved those couple of times in a relatively short period. And it wasn't just, say, moving an apartment or moving house. It was moving across, you know, to another state. And she did that twice from Indiana to Delaware, then Delaware to Pennsylvania. So those were a couple of red flags. And, you know, there's just 
there's the issue of privacy for both the parent and child. But at the same time, it opens up loopholes sometimes where people who may be investigated or think they will be investigated leave the state. And really, where where does the search or even the concern for the welfare of the child go if someone moves? And even with more recent cases, if you followed the Orin and Orson West case from out in California, they moved. And really, that could allow for things to happen to the children, because if there's no one there that they know, then there's no one there to ask questions about the children. You know, their loved ones were in a different part of the state. And then, of course, once they move, their new neighbors don't know how many children they have. So these two young boys went missing, and while their bodies were never found, they are believed to be deceased. And recently, a verdict came out They were found guilty of killing one of the children, but not the other, basically because there wasn't testimony that could prove when and where the other child had died. The West children had also been in foster care, and they had been adopted by the West family. And with Christy, there was a family member who had custody for a while. So it's children who have been in foster care, you know, that sometimes, I hate to use this term, but fall through the cracks. And even though Emma wasn't in foster care at the time or in an adoption process like the West family, there should still have been some way for people to keep in contact with her from a social services standpoint to make sure that the children were okay. I don't think any of us can really imagine doing what Christy did especially to her own child. It's disgusting and really too disturbing to actually portray what happened to this beautiful little three-year-old who died at the hands of her own mother and her stepfather helped cover it up. And unfortunately, I don't see anywhere in the near future that we will stop hearing about these types of stories. Recently, you know, again, going back to the West family, But also, there are so many high-profile cases over the last couple of years where children were killed by their parents, children who've been abused and killed by those who are supposed to love them the most and give them the care and guidance that they deserve. Instead, these children are betrayed by those that are entrusted with their care, these innocent, defenseless children. And I can't help but think, what would have happened if a child found those remains? You know, what if a child had been there playing with his dog instead of an adult walking their dog? They could have come across this horrific sight that would stay with them for the rest of their lives. I would like to end this episode with a couple of different things. First is Emma's obituary. Um, I'm going to admit the names of family members to honor their privacy, but you know, there's some information to just kind of let us know a little bit more about Emma. And then I'll also follow it up with a brief story from Emma's cousin and great aunt. Her obituary reads, quote, Emma Grace Cole was born January 10th, 2016 at IU Health Bloomington Hospital to Joshua Doubtit. And I apologize if I mispronounced that name. Emma was just three years old when she passed away in Smyrna, Delaware in September of 2019. Even though her life was short here on earth, Emma stole the hearts of so many people. Her smile could light up a room, and she was the sweetest, most loving little girl. Emma loved being outside playing at the park and in the swimming pool. She loved dogs and cats, and her favorite TV show was Paw Patrol, especially the characters Sky and Rabble. She also liked trolls and Jojo Siwa. Emma also loved big hair bows. Emma Grace was and always will be loved by so many. She was our little sunshine. We thought of you today, but that is nothing new. We thought of you yesterday and the days before too. We think of you in silence. We often speak your name. Now all we have are memories and your pictures in a frame. Your memory is our keepsake with which we will never part. God has you in his keeping. 
we have you in our hearts, end quote. And you may have noticed that Christie's name was not mentioned anywhere, um, even though I did say I would you know, leave out the names of most of the people. Um, you know, her father's name, I think I said it in the previous, one of the previous episodes where I, I um, went over this case. But, you know, the whole thing with the cats, loving cats, there was, you know, a story that her great aunt told about her getting a kitten. But also, Emma got to play with her great aunt's grandchildren. And, you know, they were about the same age. And there is a cousin named Corbin. And that's the great aunt's um, grandson. He knew that his grandmother would sing You Are My Sunshine when she put Emma to bed. And now if they visit Emma's grave, Corbin sings the song to his cousin. Now, if that isn't heartbreaking, I don't know what is. And that's where I'm going to end this really tragic story today. Like I said, Emma, you know, just had the sweetest smile and she looked so happy in pictures. And that's where sometimes pictures might not tell the whole story. She had family in Indiana that loved her dearly. And Emma's own mother was the one, though, that took her life. Thank you, everybody, for staying for the whole episode and, you know, listening to a really heartbreaking tale. I am working on my next story already um, that I kind of go down a rabbit hole. I started looking at one story or case and ended up finding a second. I was familiar with the one case, but not the other. So, um, you know, I had planned on this actually all just being part of the same episode. But with that second case, it really expanded um, what I was looking at. So hopefully I'll have that one done a little bit sooner or in a shorter time frame than it took for this one. And I really appreciate everybody's patience. Um, you know, I, I don't do this full time, so it's sometimes hard to get a steady schedule, but, you know, if I get something done earlier, then I do put it up, you know, even if it's a little ahead of my normal schedule, which has been very erratic recently. But again, I appreciate everybody's patience. And I hope everybody has a good weekend if you're listening to this on Friday. If not, have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Bye.